Um, well, good morning. At least it's morning where I am um, here in Seattle. Um, I want to thank you so much for this great privilege. Um, thank you to the Myeloma Crock for inviting me to be part of this program. Um, I think both Drs. Farrow and Libby mentioned, you know, what a great honor and how a little bit intimidating this crowd is. And I think I'm the newest kid on the block here. So it feels wonderful standing on the shoulders of the giants who've kind of spoken ahead of me and have gone ahead in this field. And it really is a very exciting time um, for our patients. And um, I know a lot has been discussed this morning. Um, I was happy to hear the presentations and I think the cases that we're gonna talk about will help kind of um, solidify some of the information that's been presented um, in hopefully a way that can be um, you know, easier to understand in the setting of, uh, of patient stories. Um, so with that, I'd like to welcome back uh, Drs. Bergsegel, Dr. Farrow, and Dr. Libby, and we'll move on with um, our first patient story. Um, so this is a story of a 50-year-old woman. She was a school teacher who um, developed back pain back in the spring of 2014. Um, and, you know, like a lot of patients, she kind of sought to go a more conservative way. She tried physical therapy, some massage, and over-the-counter pain medications with things like Tylenol, ibuprofen. Um, her pain continued to worsen in early summer, so she did end up getting x-rays that showed um, multiple compression fractures, um, but the decision was made to just continue at that time with physical therapy. Uh, by midsummer um, of that year, she, her, the pain was just significantly worse, and she was now presenting with new symptoms of nausea. Um, and so her primary care doctor um, got some additional labs at that time, um, and they were notable for a new anemia. Um, so the hemoglobin of 7.6, new evidence of kidney injury with the creatinine, elevated creatinine of 2.4, um, and hypercalcemia with a uh, value of 12.8. So this prompted further workup. Um, so she had a bone marrow biopsy um, that showed 10 to 20% plasma cells, cytogenetics and fish were normal. Uh, there was evidence of a monoclonal protein with an M spike of 3.3, and immunofixation showed IgG kappa. Um, she had elevated serum kappa and kappa lambda ratio, uh, and the beta-2 microglobulin was also elevated. Uh, she had further imaging that showed just diffuse uh, lytic disease in her um, bones, including her spine, her hips, sternum, pelvis, um, proximal femurs, and multiple compression fractures. So with all of this information, she was diagnosed with IgG kappa multiple myeloma. And based on her um, baseline characteristics, um, she was classified as uh, uh, ISS stage three at that time um, back in 2014. But if we were to apply it to the revised staging system now, she'd be considered a revised ISS stage two. Um, so before kind of moving on to what her induction treatment was and what her course was, um, just I'd like to throw, uh, you know, I'll point it to Dr. Libby first, but certainly any of our um, panelists, you, you've heard throughout the morning, there's different approaches. Um, but Dr. Libby, maybe if you can start, um, what would your approach be for induction treatment for a patient like this? Um, what are some factors that you consider in making that decision? Um, three drugs, four drugs, um, if you can comment on any of those things. One thing I want to say, first of all, can you hear me? Yeah, it looks like you can. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it, this is a, so classic that somebody has back pain that doesn't get diagnosed. It's a little surprising, but, but not really hardly at all. That they saw that she had compression fractures in her mm -hmm. spine. I, I don't, uh, I don't, this is actually a patient of mine uh, that she had compression fractures. And they said, well, you've got compression fractures. The reason for that is women get compression fractures from, from estrogen def deficiency or myeloma or uh, menopause, she was pretty young to have that, mm -hmm. but chronic back pain is just so classic in myeloma and it's just so frustrating that the diagnosis is often delayed and there are more fractures. So what would I treat right now? This is a classic presentation. I think uh, I didn't, <clears throat> I think her genetics, yes, they were normal. So this is a standard risk myeloma patient two out of three roughly <coughs> patients uh, with myeloma have standard risk. They're the patient to do especially well. And I would use, I would use RVD, um, standard RVD therapy. There's no reason uh, to use more aggressive treatment. Um, and I would follow the algorithm that I showed earlier uh, after um, would collect her cells and then depending on her response uh discuss with her the option of transplant 
uh, whether or not to do it, depending on her response and her personal feelings. Uh, Dr. Farrell or Burke Siegel, any other additional yeah. comments? I'd, I'd like to make a comment. Um, and, you know, I, I study genetics. It's, you know, one of the, the main things I do. And at the Mayo Clinic, the, the fish is, you know, it's very rarely normal. And, it, you know, if this is a patient that had been referred to me from another <coughs> hospital, I would wonder, uh, there's a lot of variability in different places as to how well the fish is performed. And often they don't isolate out the the, the myeloma cells specifically, and then they get false uh, negative results. Mm -hmm. And in a case like this, you know, if her fish showed that she had a T414, for instance, or she had deletion 17P, she would switch from being, you know, the revised ISS stage two to actually high risk disease, revised ISS stage three. And, and actually right now, I think we, and, and probably others, uh, th th there's a, a clinical trial open um, called Karma 4, which looks at actually using upfront CAR T cells in newly diagnosed patients if they have revised ISS stage three. And, um, and so in, in a case like this, if, if she were to come to me today from, from another institution uh, and get my opinion, I would say I'd like to repeat the bone marrow biopsy at, at the Mayo Clinic and really make sure that the fish was normal uh, before uh, deciding. And, um, and, if, and if she did have you know, high risk disease, RISS3, but, but you know, she didn't go on a clinical trial, I would probably, I would try and see if I could give her a four drug combination. So DARA, RVD. Um, and that's not necessarily covered by insurance. And so it, it may or may not be approved, but uh, that would be the approach I would take. If she, if she, on the other hand, if she had standard risk disease, I'd treat her just like Dr. Libby said. Sure. Um, so she actually ended up going, uh, getting started on Cyborg D. She had that, uh, some renal problems at the start. Um, and so uh, she was on cyclophosphamide, bortezomib and dexamethasone. And she got that for about seven cycles. Um, she initially had a very good response um, with her M protein decreasing, but it um, plateaued a bit. And so, and her kidney function had improved. So she actually was tra transitioned then to uh, bortezomib, lenalidomide and dexamethasone. And she continued that for four more cycles. Um, at that time, she had some, uh, some restaging uh, bone marrow that showed that her bone marrow biopsy was now less than 1% plasma cells. Um, the M spike had improved, though it was still detectable. Um, her kappa light chain had improved to normal. Um, and so at this time, we would categorize her as having a very good partial response or VGPR. Um, so uh, what is there, uh, I guess at this point, I just open up to the crowd. I know we've had different talks and Dr. Olivia went into a big uh, talk about transplant. Um, but in a patient who's had almost a year of induction treatment now, um, what, what are some of the options next or what would you recommend next for her treatment? Um, whether to continue on or go towards maintenance or go for transplant, what are, what are some of the thoughts about that? Well, hopefully she, there's been a discussion about the, the pros and cons of, of a transplant with the patient. And if she is interested in maintaining that option, then she should probably collect her stem cells before she's had a lot of exposure to Revlimid because it can deplete the stem cell pools. Um, there are times where even uh, with our best attempts, we're not able to collect enough stem mm -hmm. cells. Uh, and oftentimes we, we can get enough for two transplants if, if uh, we catch them, if we collect it early enough. Daratumumab has also been reported to decrease stem cell pools. So the, so the quadruple regimen of Dara and lenalidomide, although I haven't seen the data on that, may make it particularly challenging. So, um, and as Dr. Libby said, you can collect and bank them if you, even if you aren't uh, uh, motivated to go on to transplant right away. She's relatively young, so I would probably push her more towards doing it uh, rather than, than just um, postpone it indefinitely. One thing you don't want to do is wait until you have a lot of morbidity and then, um, you know, from your disease progression and causing problems, it can make that uh, treatment harder to withstand and um, and once you break a bone you can't unbreak it again like a compression fracture so so you do want to um, get uh, treatments before a lot of that problem develops you bring up some good points dr Farrow. so um, for patients who are starting their initial treatment maybe with a local oncologist who may not be you know um, aware of all the kind of intricacies related to transplant when would you recommend um, a patient you know, seek out a transplanter or someone at a, a you know, transplant center to, to discuss these things? 
Uh, I have a lot of patients who get referred to me uh, early in the course of their diagnosis, and but we don't usually consider collecting stem cells until they've had a good um, course of induction, uh, at least uh, four or five cycles, but preferably before they've had a year of, of treatment with Revlimid or Daratumumab. Um, so it, you know, for at least from an informational standpoint, it doesn't hurt to, to talk about things early on and get educated. Uh, so she actually did go on to get a transplant um, with high dose melphalan uh, in July of 2015, um, after which her M spike then became, you know, not detectable or too small to detect. Um, and so at this point, I think, uh, Dr. Fro, did, you did talk about maintenance uh, treatments and some strategies. So um, what would you kind of recommend for her or, you know, any of the other panelists about uh, maintenance at this point? Well, that the is standard, a, a, a the super standard hot topic. I'll let Dr. <laughs> <laughs> I'll let Dr. Libby go first and then I'll editorialize. Yeah. Um, well, one of the, the things I think that if you've gone through a transplant, one of the ways that I think is that if you've gone through a transplant, <clears throat> I want to, I want you to get the most bang for your buck out of that. It's, it's quite a journey. Um, and we can, we can prolong the response, the benefit that you get from a transplant in terms of we can pro by, by using maintenance. And the, what's, the, what's the clear cut benefit? No question benefit about a transplant right now is that it takes a longer time. It takes longer for the disease to return uh, if you get at a transplant to standard therapy than if you do not get a transplant plus standard therapy. You don't live any longer based on the study we've focused on today. Uh, but it will be longer before the disease comes back. And what that could mean is you have a longer, very high quality of life. You're just taking a pill every day or you get a shot every other week, which would be Velcade without steroids. <coughs> you live a pretty darn normal life. Now that's, that's a big, a major goal. So maintenance uh, will tend to give you, a, a, will in general, will give you a longer time before the disease returns. And because we're using low dose therapies for maintenance, I, I, my routine is to recommend it. Most patients, um, Revlimid is the standard uh, maintenance that's administered in high risk patients. At a minimum, Velcade is administered every other week. Uh, high risk meaning people with translocation 414, 1Q plus or Del 17 uh, P uh, which is perhaps the worst player in, in the, the cytogenetic abnormality list. So I, I recommend maintenance for everyone. <clears throat> and it, I also, I plea with patients to go on maintenance. And I do see people from uh, outside who fell off of maintenance for whatever reason or were never really given, given maintenance for whatever reason. Often they may be transplanted at an outside center and they relapse more quickly. I will, I will um, play devil, devil's advocate on that because I think from a <clears throat> patient's perspective- I knew you were going to. I, said do, that. <laughs> I think um, that's a standard recommendation and I do the same, but, but I think it's important to understand what we know and what we don't know and, and make an individualized decision with your, with your um, cancer doctor. So, um, I, I, what I showed, and I think doc, what Dr. Libby showed too, is that maintenance therapy doesn't make you live longer. It keeps your disease in remission longer. And so is, is, how important that is that to you? If, you, if you're monitoring your disease, you're, you're, you know, you're paying attention to how things are doing. Even if you do this, this new MRD testing uh, and you can see small changes, then you always have the option to go back on therapy at a higher dose or back on maintenance or back on a combination therapy. So we, we shouldn't get too uh, dogmatic about saying you have to do this because you know, I have some patients, I, I recommend it in, in everybody, at least they try it, but I've had some patients who just feel sick all the time on Revlimid and they're just not good for their quality of life and they don't wanna be on therapy. And then what happens is their disease comes back sooner but then they have to bite the bullet and, and kind of deal with it in a more intense way. I think it's a very personalized decision. And I think it's important to understand that and make the decision about what's best for you. In the end, it may not matter. What may matter more is that you get all the treatment options that are out there, that you don't skip anything that's potentially beneficial, but the sequencing, the timing of them may not be as important. 
Yeah, I'd like to, I actually agree with both uh, <laughs> Carol and Dr. Libby. I, I think they said the same thing in, in slightly different ways. And it's also, it's also what I believe. You know, in general, you know, I prefer to do upfront transplant as in this case, and I prefer to put patients on maintenance, um, not because it necessarily makes them live longer, but it, it, there's absolutely no question that it, that it keeps the disease away longer. And, um, and the first remission tends to be the, the highest quality remission. And I think, you know, also given how much things are changing right now, I think you heard from Dr. Libby, the excitement about these novel therapies that, that are coming down. It actually makes a difference, you know, if you relapse in, you know, four years versus mm -hmm. two years, because the therapies that will be available to you in four years are probably going to be much better than the ones available to you in two years. And so that there's an, you know, in a time when the therapies are changing so rapidly, I think there's a little bit added benefit to delaying the time before the disease recurs. I would like to say that, that there have been studies that show, for instance, a meta analysis by McCarthy that after stem cell trans autologous transplant myeloma, that maintenance does significantly prolong survival. So I don't think that, that uh, we know for sure. I, I agree. After transplant, there is some data that indicates that there may be an overall survival benefit of maintenance, but I don't, I'm not sure I've seen that replicated, but it's worthwhile considering. Dr. Berksegel also mentioned er, uh, early on about in, uh, potential um, availability of a clinical trial. And I, and I just want to second the, uh, the, um, that sentiment. I think the only way we're going to know how to sequence these treatments, how to combine these treatments, is really if we get people on clinical trials and, and learn from what we're doing. Um, I think that uh, the centers that provide clinical trial as an option are generally providing top-notch care. So I would um, definitely encourage everybody to at least consider it and, and think if the additional uh, effort uh, to enroll in a study is um, acceptable to you. Uh, and then the final thing that we haven't talked about too much, that, which is also a consideration, you know, as, as physicians, we're advocates for our patients and we're always pushing for as, as much as we can get. But these uh, treatments are all extremely expensive and there is a societal cost of going on more and more therapy. If there's not a clear benefit, I think you should ask, you know, what, what, are, you actually, uh, what are you actually accomplishing? There's some logic to doing, uh, if, if all else is equal to sequencing therapies to do your, che your cheap treatments first <laughs> and then do your expensive treatments later on. Uh, because the later treatments tend to be less long lived and it, 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 all else being equal, you would want to um, be a little bit more economical that way. I just want to put it out there because I think that um, we sometimes neglect that and it, the, the overall financial burden on society is enormous from, from some of these new treatments. Yeah, that's a great point, Dr. Farron. I know we have, um, you know, some attendees from, you know, different countries as well where the system's different. So I really appreciate that additional comment. Um, so to move on with our case, so she did go on maintenance lenalidomide, um, and actually she's been on, um, since, you know, about three months after her transplant in 2015 and has been continuing on maintenance in a complete remission now and doing quite well. Um, so, you know, for obvious HIPAA reasons, you can't put pictures up there, but she is a school teacher and again, um, doing very well, her kidney function improved, um, her pain from her bone disease has improved and I think the biggest pain that she's dealing with lately is probably with distance learning as a school teacher. So um, I think a couple takeaway points um, just to highlight from her story is, you know, she did present with what seemed like a very high disease burden um, evidence with, you know, all that bone disease, uh, anemia, hypercalcemia, you know, classic kind of um, symptoms, um, but that it's, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's irreversible. So the goal would be that with treatment, with optimal control, that we can get patients back to even potentially pre-disease states, um, and that your induction treatment may need to be modified in the beginning, um, you know, whether that's because of how you present with, uh, you know, your organs involved, or if you're not having an optimal response, but that also doesn't mean it's going to dictate how you respond to subsequent therapies. Um, so let's jump into our second case. Um, this is the story of a 42 year old man. He again started with back pain in the spring of 2010 um, and kind of went uh, again, a very similar route of trying physical therapy, seeing a chiropractor over the counter medications and whatnot. Um, but by January of 2011, the pain was significantly worsening and he ended up going to the emergency room uh, where a CAT scan was done that showed diffuse bone mats 
um, some pathological rib fractures, and a soft tissue mass along the right posterior ilium. And a biopsy of this mass was done that showed plasma cells that were capillite chain restricted. Um, so he went on to get further workup, a bone marrow biopsy showed 20 to 25% plasma cells, normal cytogenetics. Uh, Fish did show a translocation of 1114. Uh, there was no M spike that was detected, but he did have elevated kappa uh, and kappa lambda ratio. Um, and calcium, creatinine, and hemoglobin were all normal. So he was diagnosed with kappa light chain myeloma. Um, so his uh, kind of first set of treatments, he actually uh, enrolled in a clinical trial with his induction treatment. Um, and so he got the uh, backbone of cyclophosphamide, bortezomib, and dexamethasone with the addition of doxorubicin, which is uh, kind of an old chemotherapy agent. Um, he got that for four cycles and went on to get consolidation with the high-dose melphalan transplant um, in August of 2011 and started maintenance therapy. Um, unfortunately, by December of 2011, he progressed with hip pain and this was consistent with progressive disease. Um, so just to kind of throw out to the group in this and someone who's young like this, who you know didn't get um, what you would expect in terms of a, a long response with his induction treatment and transplant, um, what are some of the um, treatment options that you might be considering at this time or um, you know, what are some things that approaches that you might take now in someone like this? Well, the one thing I would say, and then I'd like to hear my colleagues speak, but is I'm sure all three of us, this story, we're worried. So something's really wrong. This is not good myeloma. Even though the testing that we did to start with suggested that it was going to be very treatable myeloma, something is very wrong. We're dealing with a, a very different and uh, uh, enemy uh, here. And I'll step out. Yeah, and I guess I, we have, if this patient was you know, presenting now, we also have clinical trial for patients that relapse you know, so mm -hmm. shortly after their, their uh, transplant, again, with CAR T cells. They're trying to move CAR T cells earlier up in the course of people who you know, have high risk disease, either by genetics or functionally like this. Um, and uh, so I would consider them high risk and I would you know, look to see if there was a clinical trial that he'd be eligible for. Um, so, oh, so the patient, um, yeah, so, so this is a kind of patient where obviously you would not consider a second transplant, uh, which since the duration of remission was so uh, low, clinical trials are always appropriate, but the patient didn't have treatment with what's now sort of standard upfront therapy with proteasome inhibitor and um, anathalamid. So it's, it's very, still possible the patient will have an excellent response if they get back on a therapy like that. I, I would like to say too that uh, I think it was uh, Leaf that had that that great uh, slide that I'll have to get from him where you're throwing darts at the dartboard and and then the bottom <laughs> part says you're throwing it at the Lord this has lawyers on it. I have a patient who's like this, very very much like this, who relapsed immediately after an upfront transplant and standard risk genetics. <clears throat> and I I literally threw a dart at the dartboard because I this was several years ago. I was not sure what to do. And uh, he, and I put him on uh, elotuzumab. I don't even know why I did it, but I, I just did it. And, uh, and I, plus an immunomodulatory drug, either Revlimid and pomalidomide, he immediately responded. It, it, he shouldn't have, it was very surprising, but he immediately responded to Amplicity or elotuzumab plus either Revlimid and pomalidomide. And, and uh, he went for many years in remission with that combination. So uh, yes, you can, we can turn things around because we're using, when you do that, I've switched him to something with completely different mechanism of action from Melphalan, the drug that we use in transplant. You may go to a, comp a different mechanism of action and boom, everything changes in the patient response. So this patient actually went on to get an allogeneic transplant. He was seen at, um, at the Hutch. So, you know, being the <coughs> center of transplants and back in the time. So I think we can have a whole round table just on transplant options and considerations and certainly allo transplant in the setting of myeloma is also a very controversial topic. So I won't really even approach that during this few minutes, um, but he did go on and have a transplant in 2012. And he actually had a, a fairly good response um, with that. So he had about four years where his disease was well controlled. 
Um, but in March of 2016, he relapsed with a new plasma cytoma along the chest wall. And a biopsy at that time showed a new, um, a muta a new mutation with the DEL17P. Um, so he ended up getting radiation and started systemic therapy with daratumumab, pomalidomide, and dexamethasone. Um, but uh, Dr. Brooks, I wonder if you can comment. I know in your talk, you talked about the, the clonal tides that can happen and um, just kind of the significance, I guess, of a, a new mutation um, you know, after his initial diagnosis. Sure, yeah. The, um, th and, th and that is basically um, our concern is that, you know, the, with every relapse, there's the concern that the mutations are acquired or, or, or grow out. And the one that you're seeing in this patient, the lesion 17P is, is one that we're, we're really worried about because we don't have good treatments for it. Um, and um, the, yeah, so that, um, so that's actually one reason we would like, you know, as much as possible to prevent relapses uh, from occurring, particularly in patients where the, where the genome is unstable and, and they have high risk disease. Um, but that, that combination that he received is, is a very active one. And I, I think a good chance it, it would work. Would that impact, um, you know, he obviously got agents that he hadn't seen before and very good anti-myeloma therapy, but does the DEL17P, how does that impact what you would choose in terms of um, combinations of treatment or uh, which, which classes you would, would you, you'd use? Well, you know, I, I, I think we know chemotherapy, which would be, you know, malfalendoxyl, uh, cyclophosphamide really doesn't respond to uh, deletion 17P. Imids, you know, by themselves really actually don't work that well either. Um, it seems proteasome inhibitors work and we, we think immune therapies like daratumumab work. Um, so per, you know, perhaps I might've been more inclined to, to, to also include a proteasome inhibitor uh, in, in, in this combination. But I, I think the daratumumab is a good choice. I think when you've got deletion 17P um, and, but I think we all, we, we, we know it, it, it still isn't the answer. Um, and uh, we, we need, I think we need to find better things. So uh, he actually didn't get much um, out of that combination. So the daratumumab, pomalidomide, dexamethasone, about three months with treatment, he still hadn't had a significant response. So he was started on carfilzomib, lenalidomide, and dexamethasone, so incorporating a proteasome inhibitor. Um, that lasted for a little over a year, and in August of 2017, he developed new lytic lesions. So uh, at this point now, we would consider him to be pentarefractory. So he's had both lenalidomide, pomalidomide, our two big imids. He's had uh, bortezomib and uh, carfilzomib, our two you know, proteasome inhibitors, and then also an anti-CD38 uh, monoclonal antibody in terms of daratumumab. So um, I guess opening it up to, again to the panel, what are some treatment options at this point? Um, you know, what, what can we do? <laughs> Well, maybe I'll, I'll just continue and, and say he does have uh, the T1114 chromosome translocation and venetoclax has been shown to be active in patients uh, with that uh, subtype of multiple myeloma. Um, and it has been made available uh, from uh, the company uh, to be used in those patients, although it's not approved by the FDA. And so if there were, obviously if there was a clinical trial of venetoclax, I'd get him on that. But if there was not a clinical trial, uh, I would see about getting him um, venetoclax, uh, um, and probably use him in the, uh, with dexamethasone. I uh, I want to second what uh, Leaf just said. I think, and we we probably didn't spend quite enough time so far talking about venetoclax. It it is a very exciting drug, another super exciting drug. It it may be the first truly targeted therapy in multiple myeloma because only really you only get a good response with translocation 1114. It changes the, the playing field because now when I hear about a patient like this, say I, I didn't know him, but he's referred to me. And I, uh, the first thing I'm gonna do is see, does he have 1114? That's gonna be the top of my mind because uh, we can give potentially this targeted therapy. We have a study. If he could get in the study, great. If he can't get in the study, I would still recommend it. Um, it's just a pill. Uh, uh, I often combine it with Velcade, but that's a, potentially it, it's very close. There's a number of studies with Venetoclax or Venclexta, very exciting drug. 
in, in, in this group of patients with 1114. And by the way, it's a significant number of people. It's uh, maybe 40%, 30 or 40% of patients with multiple myeloma have this. So it's gonna be probably gonna be a major addition to our uh, treatment toolbox and in the foreseeable future, in the next one, two or three years at the most, I would think, I certainly hope. So I, um, yeah. well, the one last thing I guess I would say about him is I have, I have a patient like this, pro probably more than one, but the one I always think about the patient almost identical to this, who, uh, not only had he failed an uh, allo transplant, but he'd also gotten CAR T's and got an, another. So at this point, a patient like this who got CAR T cell therapy got about a year and a half out of his CAR T and then relapsed. But lo and behold, he had 1114. We put him on venetoclax and he's back in a remission. It's unbelievable. But, right. And it's great. <laughs> I think you might have spoiled the ending for this patient because it's a very <laughs> similar trajectory, but we did have a few other pit stops along the way. So um, just to kind of close him out. So he did end up having, um, again, the new lytic lesions um, to control the disease at first. There was some, he did end up going, um, kind of getting conventional chemotherapy, um, which he had no response to, which Dr. Brooks, you kind of alluded to with this deletion 17P. Um, he went on to a clinical trial that was looking at a new novel, um, small molecule agent in combination with um, uh, some, you know, approved medications. And again, didn't get much mileage out of that treatment either. Um, and then he was, uh, ended up getting on a CAR T trial here at, at Seattle um, and immediately went into complete remission and was in complete remission for the next couple of years. Um, and then most recently had a relapse. Um, and as you know, we just discussed, he with that translocation of 14 was started on venetoclax and bortezomib and is again back into having a very good disease control. Um, so just to kind of sum up so our patients can see, our attendees can see, you know, over the course of about nine years since he's been diagnosed, he's obviously gone through multiple lines of therapy. Um, but, and there at times has, have, had, have had had treatments that are a bit more intense and labor intensive for him. And at other times, um, you know, was still able to uh, maintain good quality of life and continue doing the things he loves and surfing and seeing his family and enjoying that time. Um, so my last question to the group, I guess, you know, for someone who's gone through all these treatments, what are some of the newer um, uh, drugs or mechanisms or targets that are in clinical trials or in the pipeline now that you guys are most excited about um, seeing in the near future? Um, well, I, the thing that the, the next therapy or, or an, another therapy that definitely uh, is very high in my mind right now is something called BITE therapy, B-I-T-E. And so it has many similarities to CAR T therapy in how it works, but it's not as, in some ways, <clears throat> it's going, we hope it's going to be easier to administer and you can give it over and over again. Um, <clears throat> it's still somewhat early in clinical trials, but there have been some dramatic responses. And so bite therapy, uh, in my mind, is one of the most exciting uh, therapies that will be, uh, is, is being investigated all over the world. And there are literally dozens of bites. There's a, at least a dozen bite, different bites that are being studied right now. So there's intensive investigation with this form of therapy, which is, has similarities to CAR-T, but it, it's, it's different. It's only available in a clinical trial. So uh, it would be something that you'd have to go to a research center to get this therapy. I think what Dr. Libby is referring to is a bispecific antibody. Um, yes. We have, we have multiple antibody therapies already available uh, for myeloma. This patient had daratumumab, for example. Most <coughs> antibodies uh, naturally are, are so-called IgG antibodies. They have two arms on them, and they can stick onto two antigens this, of the same molecule. A bispecific antibody has been engineered, so it sticks onto the myeloma cell with one arm, and sticks onto their own T cells uh, from their immune system and brings the immune cell effector cell to the myeloma cell and induces cell killing, which is essentially the same thing that a CAR T cell does. A CAR T cell 
you've actually engineered the, the lymphocyte itself, the T cell, to have the antibody stuck onto it, and then that will uh, um, attach it to the myeloma cell and kill the myeloma cell. The problem with that approach is that it's expensive. You have to engineer uh, the cell. You have to get the lymphocytes out of the patient, engineer it, and then put it back into them. So it's a very laborious process. Whereas a, a bite antibody, you can just get, get it off the shelf and in, inject it into the patient. Yeah, I, th I think what's particularly exciting about these, these sort of T cell therapies that you're hearing about the CAR T and the, and the bispecifics um, is that there's a lot of room for improvement. There, there's different antigens that the antibodies can be directed to. Uh, there's different strategies. And so you can see, as opposed to sort of the empiricism that, that characterized the first 50 years of myeloma, that, that there's really uh, rational drug development that, that can be done with these therapies um, that, uh, that I think gives us all great hope for the future. Again, uh, our patient, you know, I think that some take home messages. So he is again, able to enjoy quality of life at this point, he's surfing, he's enjoying his kids and able to actually see and enjoy his grandkids, which is something he didn't think would be possible at nine years ago when he was first diagnosed. So um, I think a couple of take home points again, um, just that there's a variety of different treatment options and combinations based on disease characteristics as well as patient factors. And I think we've all kind of alluded to, it's really important to um, be in, in contact with uh, a specialist who specializes in myeloma, um, you know, if, even if they're gonna be working with your local oncologist, but there's so many moving parts, um, new treatments, new therapies, new combinations, um, that it would be really beneficial to have at least an expert um, opinion and, and to touch base every once in a while to see how things are moving along. Um, I think the other takeaway point is always, always consider a clinical trial option at any stage of your treatment. So even if it's induction or at your relapse, or if you've relapsed multiple times, um, there's always, you know, look, looking to talk with a, a physician about clinical trial um, enrollment. Um, and again, you know, I think um, to emphasize what we've been talking about, there's a lot to be optimistic about. Um, our goals are to maintain good disease control while allowing patients to have a good quality of life. Um, and that's always kind of something that we're trying to balance at the forefront. So um, I'd like I, to thank, yeah. yeah. Oh, Dr. Lizzie, go ahead. Uh, yeah, the only thing I wanted to add to that um, is that uh, for our attendees who are in other countries, I think uh, uh, could, clinical trials are, that's the best way to go often because many countries cannot afford the therapies mm -hmm. that we have. And it's really the only way you can get access to these amazing treatments. So. If I was in a different country, um, most countries really, the, the, the therapies that we routinely use in the United States are not routinely available. I would go to uh, the biggest myeloma center in the country and try to get on the studies as soon as I could because that's gonna give you the, the, state, the very best care that's, that's uh, available. In the United States, uh, I would point out, I'd like to point out that Really, if you if you really want to look for these these cutting edge therapies that are available only in a clinical trial, you have to go to a in general to a university center, and um, uh, and that, that's because only a university center can afford to have 10, 15, 20 trials for myeloma open at the same time. They're just not most centers aren't going to have enough most private practices just aren't going to have uh, enough myeloma patients to really be viable as a, as a major research center. So please remember that, that, that you really need to go to a big myeloma center. And I strongly recommend going to uh, a myeloma center for a second opinion if, if you're in search of uh, the very best therapies. Great. Well, Dr. Lee, thank you. And do uh, Dr. Libby and Berg Sigal and Dr. Farrow, thank you so much. Um, great ideas for these different patients. And as you can see, everybody's treated differently, you know, as you can see, it's, it's a lot. So I echo, consider a clinical trial always, even as a newly diagnosed patient. Music